Thank you so much for um, uh, joining us on, on the podcast today, Holly. Uh, can, can I start with just asking a little bit about yourself and, and your background? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Blake. Uh, it's awesome to have this opportunity. First podcast for me today as well. So um, yeah, really stoked to be on. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I have a bit of an interesting background. I actually um, went to uni. I'm from WA, Margaret River. I love wine, love, love surfing. Um, I'm not a good surfer, but just love the, the ocean. <laughs> Um, and I actually went overseas and um, studied in Boston. And when I came back, my brother was working in mining. So I went up to work in the Pilbara region of, of WA. Um, long story short, started an, um, a, a, a career, I guess, in the mining industry, which I had no way planned any way, shape or form. And I landed in a kind of a safety and operations role. And I guess a turning point for me in my career was um, experiencing in that role uh, two people who, who um uh, lost their lives to fatality in mining. Um, I became, I guess, kind of obsessive at that point around uh, human behaviour and why we make decisions and, you know, how we can really shift culture. And I, I pursued at that point um, a master's uh, in business leadership and this idea of organisation development and change. Um, and that kind of turned me down a path of really focusing on psychology-based change, uh, learning and development, leadership development, uh, you know, and, and, and from that point, I basically traveled the world um, working in fatality prevention programs with some super interesting um, and awesome clinical psychologists, neuroscientists. And um, yeah, I just I love the idea of um, brain based kind of work. Uh, I then was lucky enough to join a big four consulting firm and that really expanded my career and, and, and kind of built a practice in the people and change space um, here in Brisbane. Uh, and from that point, I started to work across sectors, industries, um, really focusing my energy in on this idea of leadership and organisation development. Uh, became a mum. Uh, that was another massive turning point um, and decided to uh, leave the big four consulting world for a period of time. Um, took on a role to head up public sector capability building uh, for a year, which was great. But it also encouraged me to just think about maybe for, for a period of time, I should start my own thing. And, and a year ago, um, I took the leap of faith and started my own business north. Uh, and we kind of aim to build courageous leaders, um, really bring together this idea of united and capable teams uh, and secure impressive performance. That's really our mission. Oh, amazing. Congratulations. Yeah. It's always yeah, thank a, you. a scary step to, to jump out and sort of, yeah. uh, you know, do, do your own thing and, and, and change it all up a bit. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's such an awesome history. It's, it's very varied and and I think uh, tugs tugs on a few heartstrings there. I can definitely see, you know, why, why something yeah. like that might have a big impact on you. Thank you. Um, out of that, you've got a bit of a varied background. Um what, what are some of, if you had to distill it down and, and distill a couple of lessons to, to maybe some of the, the people that are listening today, uh, what, what would you sort of uh, bring down and distill to, to L&D departments or um, what are the key things you reckon you've learned? Yeah, that, that's a great one. I, I think there's probably some personal lessons around career and aspiration and then some absolute, there's, there's so many lessons around L&D organizational development um, I'm still learning I still see myself some days as as an amateur and I, I guess the first learning to that point in both a personal career perspective but also an L&D perspective is surrounding myself and a, and a lesson or an insight is to surround myself with those who um, have strengths that complement mine so you know I know we're going to get onto this um, a bit later you know I'm, I'm not a tech guru but tech enabled <laughs> learning is critical so, uh, you know, I had a wonderful partnership with um, an ex-colleague of mine who just really was into tech-enabled learning, but I was the creative design person. So really bringing strengths together, I think, um, and on a personal front in your career, doubling down on strengths. I just believe in a strengths-based culture. So that's kind of insight, I guess, one, um, follow your purpose and passion. And I think, once again, from a personal perspective, if you're not aligned to your purpose, then you've got no passion in what you do. And I think that sees, you know, a decline in performance. Certainly in the L&D space, um, I think all capability building and initiatives need to be linked to, a, you know, individual purpose and the organisational purpose, absolutely, and, and their strategy. So um, the idea of purpose and passion, the idea of strengths, and then I think taking a leap of faith, like you just mentioned kind of before, um, opportunities don't always seek you out. You know, I've really learned in my career um, that you need to seek out the opportunities, um, tell people your story. Um, you know, you can do that in a humble and authentic way. Um, yeah, so yeah, they're probably my insights from a career perspective and a link into l and I know we're going to spend some time together exploring deeper insights around my learnings in the kind of uh, L&D space as well. So I'll pause there. Yeah. 
No, amazing. Thank you. And and so you, you mentioned strategy in there and and sort of tech enablement and a few things. Um, yeah. Have you? How do you go about aligning some of those L and D sort of strategies and business strategies to the purpose and, and sort of the passion of, of the business? Because I think it can be it can be yeah. a harder thing, yeah. you know, uh, to to do. Yeah, it's very easy to talk about, but sometimes quite hard to execute on. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm so thrilled you've asked that question. Uh, it's something I am encouraging organisations to do. I believe it is critical to do um some buy into it some don't so I'm, I'm keen to explore that as well but um and, and I don't think I think it's a bit of art and science so uh you know to your question around strategy and the link to L&D um we, we just shouldn't be doing learning and development that's not linked to our strategy you know unless it's for a sole purpose of motivating people but I think you can have the two together even in, in that case so I would argue that it's, it's crucial um I think, you know, an organisation, most organisations have a purpose. Some use it, some don't. So, you know, some can sit on a shelf in a strategy document. Some really bring it to life. And, uh, you know, the questions at the start of that bringing together of the strategy and organisational purpose and your L&D strategy is really starting to say, well, what are the kinds of leaders and the workforce that we need to deliver our strategy? Yeah. You know, um, what are the things we need to do to fulfil our organisational purpose? When you start there, that, that's an exploratory question and you're starting to get people to even contemplate that there is a link. And so I think that's a, a key kind of insight to getting buy-in that the two should link. Yeah. Uh, but then how do you practically do that? Uh, there are many ways. Um, I can give you a few examples. I think, um, you know, the first thing you should be doing is thinking about what are the capabilities, what are the mindsets, what are the behaviours that we need in our business to deliver the things that we need to deliver in our strategy, right? So there's an inextricable link between your priorities of your business and, your you know, the way that you design learning initiatives. Um, you know, that that can be done in a really collaborative workshop. It, it's a bit of art and science, as I said. It's, it's whiteboarding some of the things. It's testing. It's going back to things like research and saying, what are the skills you need to solve complex problems? You know, uh, what are the things you need uh, to build adaptive leadership in your business, which is critical in times of, you know, this VUCA context that everyone's talking about. So there's a bit of the, the mapping piece. Um, and then I absolutely believe it's applying some really contemporary, you know, leadership development, organisational development principles, like, um, you know, putting learners at the centre of design. They have to be at the center. How do they like to learn? What are the barriers to learning in your business? Um, how do we bring all of these facets together? And you start to do this really great contextual analysis piece. Um, I know that might be mind boggling for some, but I, I think that is the crucial point. You've got to stay in the mess of the complex problem. You've got to figure all of this out. And then absolutely, the last thing I'd probably say on that, that is that you have to engage your business in this process. This is not an HR team a learning team doing it in the corner it's a crucial time to build you know momentum and excitement and re-engage passion for learning if you bring your business into creating this stuff so i'll leave it there i know you might want to dive into some of those areas but i clearly uh think that this is critical yeah yeah no absolutely i think i, I love what you say about how it's a bit of an art and a science there i think that's that's true and i think that people mm. can get a little bit bogged down on both of those fronts sometimes mm. and think it's just one of the two um yeah and and I think that, yeah, look, if you don't put the learners at the front of it, <clears throat> you're sort of doomed to fail, right? Like if, yeah. if it's not what they're looking for or after, it becomes quite hard. And I guess um, from that point of view, you've mentioned some of the things to, to do maybe, but what, what are some of the, the consistent or common hurdles that you see organizations hit when they're trying to to do that alignment piece? Like is is there some, some challenges yeah. that arise that you sort of see, I guess, commonly or consistently? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the one is, um, you know, collective leadership at the top, buy-in, that this stuff's important. Um, yeah. That's the issue or hurdle I first see. And I think there's some ways you can overcome that. Um, one way could be, and I've tried this before and, it, and it's worked, is to ask some really powerful questions. So to ask the question I mentioned before, you know, hey, hey executive leaders, you know, we've got this really critical strategy here do we feel really confident that we've got the leadership and the workforce we need to deliver on this? Um, do, do we, have we really articulated the skills required to do this work? Do we think we've got them? Uh, what do we think we need to do about that? Because when you ask, are we really confident? Um, people start to go, oh, are we? You, you know, and there's this contemplation. So, you know, when I think about applying psychology-based 
change principles. It's that we've got to bring people on to a level of them contemplating that there's an issue here to resolve or an opportunity for, for the business. Um, so first issue, buy-in. Um, mm. uh, second issue, probably encouraging people to stay in the analysis and the mess of the issue and know that that's an adaptive complex problem and that actually there's not one right or wrong answer. And I see businesses often just referring back to a dictionary of competencies and saying, this will do, you know, or we'll take it and tailor it a little bit for us. I don't think that's the right approach. I don't think you get buy-in. I see those things sit on shelves. Um, I'm not saying, you know, competencies are, competencies are not required, but I just think there's a better way of, of, of um, really bringing together a few things, strategy, engagement with your business, and really brilliant learning. Uh, and that doesn't come from a competency framework, assuming that leaders are going to have all of these same things, right? Leadership is about uh, doubling down on strengths and being unique. So, um, yes, yeah, so th th there's a challenge there. So staying in the mess of the problem and doing the work to, um, you know, to come up with really great insights around what your business needs in the L&D space. Um, they're probably the two main things I I'd call out. Yeah. Okay. I, I like that saying you use it a couple of times, stay in the mess of the problem. <clears throat> I think that's, that's, yeah. you know, sometimes I guess the, the natural instinct is to run from the mess of the problem. Right. But, but you, you've got to really yeah. be part of it to solve it. Yeah. Yeah. And what we do, right. When we don't stay in the mess of the problem is we just apply a process that we've used before or, or that we've seen somewhere else. And we say we're being context specific or bespoke because we're doing a bit of tailoring, but um. You know, I often see from a consulting perspective, tenders go out in the market and a business says, you know, we know we want to build conflict resolution training as an example, or we want to build adaptive leadership. And quite often when you go into the business and you really start to work with their learners, you see that's maybe not what they need at all. And you start to realize they've not done the upfront analytical piece, planning piece, engagement piece before they get to deep design. Yeah. And I'm not an analysis person, so I don't think you need to do that until you've got it perfect, right? Sometimes you've got to back some decisions and run with it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I guess once you've got that buy-in and you've done that analysis, those, those sort of two steps, how do you then uh, find the, the best way to prioritize what's next? Like, how, how do you then break <laughs> that down into, okay, well, now we've yeah. got the foundation, what do we do? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm laughing because I'm going through that with one of my wonderful government clients here in Brisbane at the moment, you know, and you want to, you know, the aspiration was to target two to three initiatives, you know, and then you get all excited about all these possible things we could do and re-engage and re-excite people with this idea of learning and, and curiosity. And um, yeah, so so prioritization is tough. And, and uh, I think it's a bit of two things. The first thing is I believe you can get quite targeted in your initiatives when you do the right mapping between your strategy um, and, and your learner needs um, and bringing those two ideas together. You can, you can cut some things off the list. Um, I think then there is a bit of kind of maybe we call it research or benchmarking, but a bit about, you know, what is my industry need now and into the future? So I think there's always a future focus. You know, let's not because capability takes time, right? You, you know yep. that capability Absolutely. building takes time. So let's focus on now and a bit of the future and the aspiration. Let's make it a bit aspirational. So another idea around prioritization is then really thinking about what else is important to a business. So I think, yes, there's the strategy piece, what we need now and into the future, but also like things like cultural data. So what's the, the cultural journey we're on? Uh, you know, is there a real need right now for a specific group of leaders to have some stretch opportunities? because it's going to boost our culture. So there's some other considerations you play into the prioritizing. Um, you know, there's some really practical things around, do we want, um, you know, to provide learning at the same time for different cohorts or layers, you know, of, mm. of leadership or, or workforce? Do we want to cross-function our, our learning to build collaboration? So I think you can kind of um, do a number of things at once and it doesn't necessarily mean learning overload for an individual, right? The important point I'd make about that, though, is it's got to be integrated. You know, people over in column A shouldn't be doing something completely different and unrelated in column B. There's going to be a story for the organisation that really connects this together. And the story needs to be linked to your strategy, your purpose and your cultural aspirations, right? Yeah, yeah. It all comes back to that strategy, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Sort of hard to, to benchmark. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Con context, strategy. <clears throat> purpose you know and then who are the learners and what do they need yeah 
And, and so, so once you've done that sort of prioritization, then I guess the next step is like, there's all this stuff we could do. Uh, you probably, like you just mentioned, right? There's, you can get excited and you can start to look at a million different sort of things. Um, how do you then sort of break down a, a like a, a use case for a budget or, or sort of a business case to, to sort of put that together? Because obviously we've got sort of like a limited amount of resources, right? And most organizations can spend. So how, how do you sort of find the best way is to sort of, I guess, go back to that first stage of getting that buy-in again and, and sort yeah. of bring that business case up? Yeah. In some ways, I'm lucky because in my role now in my business, usually those things happen before I come into play. However, in saying that, I do work with a lot of businesses that say, you know, how do we convince the, the executives? Um, how do we prioritise the budget? How do we plan for that? Um, I have a few things that I see probably go wrong that have convinced me that this is an insight or something I should share. And one of them is around organisations that try to do everything. Yeah. Uh, and I often speak to my clients and they say to me, you know, Holly, we've done this for three years now. We've spent a million dollars in, in learning or in leadership development. And, you know, we've been told it's tailored and contextualized, but we've not got the sustainable impact or outcome, you know, at a business level or a behavioral change level. Um, so I think it's not trying to do too much. It's actually um, thinking about spending your budget wisely. And that comes from firstly, design and planning well, um, I think it's about picking two to three initiatives, maybe, and really focusing on targeting your budget at those and doing them over time. Like I see businesses changing their kind of learning and development approaches or where they put their budget every six to 12 months. But we know that culture change and even capability building can take a couple of years. Yeah. So I'm convinced that even if you were to choose the wrong things to focus on they would have a positive impact on your culture if you double down and did them over time um, so I think thinking that's that's a bit about thinking about where to place your budget um, the business case to get the budget well I think that's th maybe threefold um, you know it's back to the question at the round table around do we think we've got the people we need to do what we're trying to do and the impact of showing them maybe the consequence of the impact of of not spending the money in L&D. So, okay, great. What would be the situation if we don't have people capable enough to do the work of our business? Yeah. You know, are we okay with that? Um, you know, so that's the bit of the convincing piece. How much budget? I think sometimes people need to hear the results, see the results. We know that takes time. But, you know, sometimes you can wheel in people that have, you know, undertaken the meaningful learning and development and they can talk about how impactful that's been to them or their teams you can you can draw out stories and anecdotes that help convince people to expand the budget it's about starting somewhere yeah absolutely yeah. and I, you you mentioned then sort of the the, the impact that that happens in training how, how do you how do you sort of go about showing that like ROI or or sort of yeah. that return on, on the investment of training, right? It's a really tricky thing to do. There's a lot of causation yeah. and, and there's a lot of correlation and sometimes it's hard to yeah. get you to talk. Um, how have you seen that work? Yeah, that that's an, that's another great question. And I think there's different views around that. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, so, so how do I encourage organizations to measure or evaluate ROI? Sorry. Um, the first thing is I kind of ground my principles around this in Kirkpatrick's framework. So Kirkpatrick's talks about evaluation of learning uh, around looking at layers. So your business impact uh, is one layer. Um, that's really tough to measure. We know that to really measure a learning intervention, uh, having a causal effect on a business um, outcome can take a number of years. I've only ever worked with one client who's stuck to that and they've seen it ring true, right? They've, but they've, you know, it's a five-year journey for them. Yeah. Uh, the second thing, obviously, Kirkpatrick kind of talks about is the idea of measuring application and behavior change in the learners. Um, and then they go down to, you know, kind of reaction. Did I enjoy the experience, et, et cetera? Um, I ground my measurement and evaluation approaches in that. However, I don't think that's the only thing we need to think about. I think we can kind of once again take a tangent and say to a business, what would it look like if this learning and development, you know, process or experience or program, whatever you want to call it, um, makes a difference to our business? What would really good look like? What's our aspiration in this? What would we notice that's different? And you can actually do that upfront work by the way that needs to happen, not after the learning occurs, but right up in your strategy and design phase. And when you can help a business articulate that, 
then you can start to build in your measurement around that. So how are we, you know, who are the people we're going to talk to that are going to share that there has been a change in the leader or the learner behaviour? How are we going to get them to self-report on that change? You know, and there's so many different methods by which we can do that. So I think there is a bit of grounding in the research-based theory. There's a bit of um, helping to, you know, uh, help organizations to uh, really deeply articulate what good looks like as an impact and it might not just be business outcomes it might be cultural I think there's causation and correlation are both good one thing that uh, I've actually tried with a client recently that I thought really had um, a, a big impact and to some of the questions you've asked me before around convincing execs that this is important etc was we shared we, we ran some collaborative insight sessions after a six month experience, we actually did them up front, but we did them at the end as well, mm. brought in some of the execs, brought in the sponsors, and the learners really shared some of their rich and deep experiences. Uh, we mapped those on a wall, we shared stories. And actually, when you can capture some of that, whether it's in post-it notes or, you know, on a whiteboard or filming the, the learners before they start the program, and then at the end, and you can create a rich picture and story and share that back. I mean, that convinces anyone, surely you know uh so yes but business impact critical you can do it it takes time i believe in it um i also think you can get rich qualitative insights around the shift in your business um, from a business outcome perspective and a culture perspective by you know designing creative evaluation approaches yeah absolutely H humans love a good story right it, it's always something that that works yeah. never fail. Yeah. You, you mentioned yeah. something there that I, I found quite interesting so um, you said that uh, you've had one client that has gone through that framework, the Kilpatrick model, which, you know, everybody likes to talk about, but you're 100% right. There <laughs> people actually go through it. What do you think the difference yeah. is? Why did they go through it where other clients or other, other organisations don't? Yeah, uh, it was the Defence Force. Uh, yeah. So they generally, you know, were um, bought into the idea of measurement. Uh, yeah. So that's one thing, right? We know that people need to be bought into it. They were investing um, a decent amount of money, and this is when I was with a, a big four firm, to actually undertake a, a program that, you know, I think one thing, relationships were there. So they were convinced in the advice of, of the people in the team um, to which I was a part of. Um, they took our advice. Not often do people want to spend 10 grand, let alone 200 grand in the evaluation, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so there was a couple of things that were right. Uh, you know, the client was convinced this was a good outcome. They were willing to try it. They knew that their journey was going to be a three to five year journey and that um, they were already committed to that, right? Yeah. Um, so they, they were the kind of factors that were in, in play. Um, for the most part, what I see is organisations that, you know, and I know why they do it. If they, if they search the market for great L&D suppliers, how do they really know that you're good until you partner with them and build a trusting relationship? And the issue is that what they do then is they, um, you know, they secure a contract with you for six months or 12 months or 18 months. We know that if we do a great job and we build really wonderful relationships and help them have an impact, we stay there for the most part. Um, but a lot of people, you know, a lot of organizations I come into, they've had four different providers in the last three years, which makes evaluation really tricky unless you've got a great kind of technology system or organizational development team capturing and keeping all of that data in house and knowing what to do with it. Yeah. I also don't see that happens a lot. Yeah. 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 And I guess that, that, that I guess leads into to the question of like how important is technology and, and in yeah. that learning environment and how do you see that used really well and, and, and maybe not so yeah. Yeah, it's critical, right? And uh, that's the biggest learning opportunity for me. That's why I'm kind of laughing. I wanted to say, Blake, help me learn something about <laughs> this. Um, it's critical uh, to all facets of learning. So right up front in your analysis, I mean, the rich data organisations have uh, because of the culture surveys they do or the performance development conversations they have, they capture all this stuff, but we know they don't use it well. And mm. in fact, I've not seen too many great systems that allow for um, the data to come together and then I see the challenge in people not knowing how to draw the insights so I quite often get sent uh, you know I request these documents from clients when I'm doing that strategy mapping piece to the capabilities just give me your data and I see you know 60 pages of graphs and <laughs> models and I'm kind of going but what's the insight guys what, what's the insight so technology that could provide the insight you know I don't know if that's possible I'm sure it is 
um, that'd be amazing. Uh, but yeah, in the analytical phase, um, you know, grabbing rich data from technology around your people and where they're at is, is critical. You take that a step further into your kind of delivery. I'm going to skip over design for a minute, but into delivering great learning. I mean, people need to learn in the flow of their work. They need to get on the bus in the morning and have three minutes where they can click a link and they can hear something great that's going to set their intentions for the day or remind them of the conversation they need to have. And one of the barriers uh, with practitioners uh, in the space I work in is hearing how time poor people are to learn. I think technology plays a critical role in enabling learning at, at any time. I think that needs to come together with your kind of face-to-face -face structured learning, right? So technology for delivery, critical, whether it's an LMS or something that can, you know, you can plug in and text your coach or that it can push you some curated content. I mean, amazing, right? And, and then once again, in your evaluation, when you can store all the stuff, pull out data, show measurement of ROI and impact, I mean, yeah, I, I can't wait to hear more about what technology has got to offer us in the learning space. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess it's um, it can be a bit of a blessing and a curse technology at times as well, right? Yeah. <laughs> when you're like me and don't know, don't know what's possible, you know, but, <laughs> yeah. but no, it's great. It's great. And then you mentioned like a few learning opportunities there. So sort of, you know, you've got your face to face, maybe coaching, um, which like I think coaching is the most underutilized thing uh, ever. Yeah, um, me too. But that there's a lot of different opportunities and, and learners can get like bombarded with quite a lot. How, how, what's your yeah. sort of opinion on, um, you know, self-directed yeah. learning versus uh, that may, maybe like created or guided learning and, and, you know, where's that balance, right? Because you could give somebody one option, which they might not like as, and, and sort of call it guided. Um, you could give them 10 options and maybe it's too many or, you know, yeah. you've got go one LinkedIn learning and all these amazing systems that have, literally hundreds of thousands of different sort of choices and yeah. selections for, for, for learners. So how, how do you sort of see that in, in the sort of landscape at the moment? Yeah, that, that's, you got some brilliant questions. I, um, I, I think there's a place for both is my simple answer. Uh, you know, so what we know about learning, right, is it needs to be self-driven to a degree of like you need to be able to be, find passion in it, be engaged in it. It's both, I think, reflective and social you know, and it's bringing this idea of blended together. So people talk about blended. What does that actually mean to me? It's, yeah. um, you know, uh, if you get it right in your design phase where you're really putting the learner at the center and saying, what do these people need uh, right now in terms of how they need to learn? What's the environment and the context telling us? What are the kinds of things they're learning? Because some things, you know, knowledge uplift, simple knowledge uplift. Why would you bring people together now in a face-to-face -face workshop for that when you can plug them in three, eight-minute pieces of content over the course of a week and then bring them together for what I would say is the moments that matter, you know, where the rich application, the connection happens within a group. So I think the simple answer for me is there's a place for both uh, self-directed yep. and guided. Uh, I think you know, the guided bit happens because we know that people need to learn certain things to deliver our strategy, right? And we provide that. Uh, how we provide that is dependent on the learner and the context and the budget and all sorts of things. Uh, people also need to really feel motivated for learn to, to learn. People will not embed and sustain behavioural change unless they want to go from knowing to doing. Yeah, and that comes from a bit of choosing your own adventure. And I think blending the two and the art of that is is critical. Yeah. Yeah. And and so you mentioned sort of behavioral change and you've also mentioned things like capability building. Um, yeah. How, how do you sort of, um, how do you go about building those capabilities or, or behavioral change in, in learning? Like, well, what do you look for to be successful there? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, there's so many great ideas out there now uh, and and I this is probably my passion area and, and I think it's my strength I love getting creative and showing organizations they don't have to buy an off-the-shelf modulized uh, content delivery leadership program or learning program anymore you know and people say they do bespoke and tailored but uh, but you know how do we do good learning I think once again I, I, I don't want to rehash it too much but it comes in doing the upfront work you've got to do you know, your, your analysis, your planning, um, putting the learner at the center, bringing in the strategy piece. We, we've talked about that. That's crucial. Um, how do you bring those experiences to life? I believe they need to be leadership or learning experiences, not programs. 
the difference to me is you're not signing up and doing four modules and then you're spat out at the end and you're expected to go back into your organization, which is a complex system, and be different or do different. I think learning does not place enough emphasis on the embedding and the sustaining of behaviors. Why? We try and learn too much, you know, or too quickly. Uh, we don't take the time or put our budget into the back end. And once again, right now, I've got three clients saying to me, we know the knowledge uplift is important. We know the social learning is important. What we really want to make sure is that people come back into our business and, you know, are empowered and the barriers are removed to them doing this stuff sustainably. So there's yeah. a couple of things to that as well, right? Um, great learning to me is where you've activated the whole system of the organisation. You have sponsors, not because they just sign off for the learning or have one leader learner interaction. You have true sponsors. You, uh, you, know, you are welcomed to provide insights to the business around the things that are standing in the way of those learners doing things differently. Um, people that come back into a system, or as my wonderful wise friend, uh, her name is Dawn, says, you know, how are we preparing people in our learning to go back to base? Yeah, That's a whole intervention in its own right. So su summing this passion point up of mine, great learning is a combination of knowledge uplift, social and reflective processes, and then doubling down on this idea of embedding and sustaining and building the system in your business to support people to, to uh, you know, really sustain behavioural change over time. That is where you get the culture change benefit. Yeah, and I, 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 I guess you touched on a couple of things that I really agree with there. So uh, first, the contextualization. I think that that gets lost quite a lot, and that's why they're off-the-shelf yeah. uh, products. Like for some things, they work really well, but they definitely don't work for really well for all things. We, we had Matt Jertson on a little yeah. while ago, um, and he was the head of L&D at SpaceX, and... Yeah. He's huge on contextualization. Who slips in? He said, "You know, you send people on this OHS training, and then they come back, and they're not in a rocket factory when they go do the training, and then they're in a rocket factory, right. and it's like you're making a rocket. It's really right. loud, and then all that stuff is just is, is just gone." Um, Couldn't agree more. Secondly, the behavioral change, um, and and I think that because of the school system and the university tertiary education system, we focus on knowledge and we don't focus on behaviors, right? So. Um, yeah. It becomes tricky for L&D. And I guess, how would you see the difference between, you know, uh, a knowledge training um, uh, sort of, I, I guess, approach and, and a behavioral train, uh, change based approach? Let's, let's take the capability or the, the thing we're trying to learn and, and let's take the VUCA context we're operating in and, and something that I get asked, um, you know, to help people learn is this idea of collaboration or complex problem solving. They're both really tough things. Firstly, they're not one skill. Uh, they're a combination of micro skills, mindset shifting practices and behavioral change. And when you think about um, bringing together two concepts, the thing you need to learn, the complex problem solving and the learner and where they're at, you start to unpack this and say, well, there is knowledge to learn here. And I would say the knowledge in complex problem solving is how to use an issue tree, which is a tool to problem solve, right? Now you can learn that through an eight minute podcast, you know, even better, you could contextualize that podcast and build one for your business and plug it back in your LMS or whatever, right? And uh, so, so there are ways of building knowledge to my principle around that, I don't think that needs to always be in a workshop and wasting precious capacity to build knowledge. Uh, you can also learn knowledge through others showing you on the job, right? That 70, 20, 10 principle. Yeah. Then we think about the other whole piece around complex problem solving. And, and, you know, I'm probably not doing complex problem solving justice here because I'm just going to talk about a couple of components of it. But what we know underpins being able to, com you know, problem solving complexity is things around ego, around self-management, around confidence, right? People don't feel confident to try and test and fail as we say they should. You know, there's a whole piece around building psychological safety in a group dynamic there. And that comes from really great coaching, facilitating and a group being set up in the right way. You know, we don't just set up to talk about the task. We talk about how we're going to work together. Um, that is learning in a social setting. And um, building confidence is the last thing I'll touch on in this like kind of idea of complex problem solving as the, the thing we're learning. Confidence, that comes from reflective self-work, guided with a coach, perhaps. Um, you know, how do you learn that? You learn that through building deep insight around what's holding you back from who you want to be and where you want to go. That can be done through uh, reflective learning, you know, 
listening to, you know, great TED Talks, reading a book, but also having this engagement with a coach and being in a safe place to be vulnerable, you know, and then committing to do the self-work. That's another whole piece. So I have a view around things like confidence and, and, and I don't think we focus still enough on the self learning the self-development the personal insight building so when we show up in a group and we want to do all these things like collaborate and problem solve in in complex situations we're not feeling brave enough to do it uh, so you know key points here um i think when you look at what you learn through knowledge uplift through versus like social learning and maybe more workshop style or online webinars it's really thinking about what is learnt in this thing through knowledge uplift as in, you know, tools, frameworks, techniques, um, yep. theory, theory, yep. you know, versus what's the stuff you've got to learn through experiencing being in a group and failing or coming into conflict situations or feeling uncomfortable. And that work is best done with kind of really great facilitators, coaches and, uh, you know, mentors. Yeah, absolutely. Like uh, I think confidence is something that does not get, uh barely any focus really actually like retrospectively looking at that like yeah. something that's so important because without it yeah. how do you do anything else <laughs> yeah 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 exactly you know we just assume I think that people are going to show up and bring and be their best every day um what I see in every every room and probably every single leader or learner I've worked with over time is uh, a, a real uh challenge in some way shape or form around self and if yeah. you can build that, anything's possible because that person is then going to maximize their potential, feel bold enough to challenge status quo. You know, that's how you get innovation. That's how you get creativity. That's how you get high performing, you know, teams. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's such a good point. I'd be very curious to know your thoughts on um, uh, capability and competency sort of development and how you define them. Mm -hmm. So you you mentioned capability and competencies a couple times uh, as we've sort of been chatting um, and terminology aside, you know, different people class them as different things. Um, but but yeah. how, how would you sort of define a capability or a competency um, to, to, I guess maybe this is a little bit of a loaded question, but we, we sort of work yeah, in the capability space where we sort of say, look, there's a lot of things you can say is a skill. There's, and there's, the reality is uh, we think that there's too many. Um, but how do you then bundle those skills into something tangible and meaningful that you can then align to a business strategy? Do you have any sort of advice on that? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess my first piece of advice is that, that there is, you just called out the challenge, right? We all call things differently. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we all categorize differently. I'm not a purist by definition in any of that stuff. But um, I'm grappling with that right now with a client. And I think um, the, the simple answer is every business is different. And that's why having some guiding principles around this is helpful. But um, I also think there's too many, there's too many skills out there. Yeah. If, you're, if you're going back to your kind of mapping and the principles I take, I think about, I, I start with a big list. What you start to see, though, is when you talk about things like complex problem solving or um, courageous conversations or and when you start to break down all the things that sit under that, you start to see some theming and some grouping. Um, I have often found the, the best way that learners gravitate toward this stuff and um, you can set a common language in a business is to kind of pick your capabilities and not too many. Yep. You know, so you might have, you know, and I'm not talking technical, let's talk kind of more leadership and people mm -hmm. and softer. I think they're the harder things to learn, but softer people call them. Um, and then I actually think it's easiest to break those down into really clear behavioral script descriptors. And those behaviors or the things people are doing, if they have this capability, that needs to be in the language of the business, right? Yep. So I'm finding that's been really helpful lately. I don't know whether that's right, though, you know, but I don't think there is a right anymore. I know what's not working. That's the dictionary of competencies tailored yeah. by a level saying that you're this level. So you're in this box that doesn't that just doesn't, doesn't work. So, yeah, I don't have a, a precise way. But the way I'm finding that's working best at the moment is being clear on your capabilities. I share a viewpoint with you. A capability to me is more than just a behavior it's a whole way of thinking about the system you know yeah. that enables that uh, so i think but that to me comes in with your kind of learning design yeah. yeah 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 but capability link it to some really clear behaviors make it punchy make it in the language 
also you can add in, and I, I did this uh, just recently and it worked well, what that capability is, but what it's not. Yeah. yeah what it's not. That's, because that's people, great advice. That's yeah. great advice because I think that, that that's something that people don't do. <laughs> yeah. 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 How do I know when I'm signing up to be in your new system, your new business, your, your organization, that this capability is important and the narrative behind it and how it's going to help me do the things I need to do every day, but mm -hmm. also what it looks like when I'm not doing that and how I really know uh, that I don't possess that capability. That's the, that's the challenging point, right? People go, I've got all of those things. I've got all of those things. I can complex problem solve. I can collaborate. Really? Collaboration is not sharing information. Yeah. Problem solving is not giving people answers. Yeah. So, Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're very different. Yeah, that's that's great advice. And I, I guess think you and yeah, you and I, sorry, could talk about this for hours because I'd be really keen outside of the podcast for your views on this because it's oh, something yeah. I'm seeing businesses ask me about every day, and I'm trying testing and seeing what works, what doesn't. Yeah, and look, that's that's why we're sort of, I guess, in the space we're in is because uh, we have seen very, very few organizations implement capability or competency frameworks well. And the vast majority of them that have created them, uh, they live on a shelf, like you mentioned earlier. And it's it's kind of heartbreaking because without it, it's really hard to define and align things to strategy. So it's sort of, it's, it's yeah. a big circle, really. Um, well, and do you know what's heartbreaking about it is when they tell you that half of their L&D budget has been spent on building this amazing document and it's not used. Yeah, and it's and, <laughs> and actually, you could have been providing learning, any learning, and it would have had more of an impact than the $200,000 you, 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 know, you paid That's to produce a document that no one uses. And put it on a shelf. Great. Yeah, it's a challenging it's one. terrible. And, and you, you work in the leadership space quite a lot. And, and so uh, this is always a bit of a fun question, but I think we get some different answers for uh, yeah. when people speak. But, but what, what is leadership? What yeah. do you leadership as? Yeah. I'm inspired by kind of a couple of people. People probably call them out. Simon Sinek, I think he's yeah. great. Brene Brown, um, definitely Marcus Buckingham. He's got some really great and challenging thoughts around this. I, I think leadership is the ability to do a number of things it's about having followers people that look up to you I think it's about you being authentic knowing what you stand for and leaving a legacy with others that does good for them for for society I think that's leadership I think leadership is about the art of constant personal uh, change and renewal it's it's unlearning it's relearning um, it's giving back uh, you know it's hard to to just define it right um, I think it's about in these times, leadership in these times, these complex VUCA uh, times, it's around holding people productively in discomfort. That, yeah. that to me, and that's Heifetz and Linsky's work there from, from Harvard, and they're brilliant. Adaptive leadership, that is, to me, the leadership we need. It's not about anymore telling people it's going to be okay. Yes, we have empathy and compassion, but we help people through the discomfort that's inherent in really uh, complex challenges that make us yeah. feel uncomfortable yeah, yeah it's about it's definitely not about positional authority yes that's very true yeah if you're not uncomfortable yeah. you're probably not growing to you know if, if everything's comfortable um, yeah absolutely uh and i guess lastly uh where can people find you that have listened <laughs> yeah where can they find me i'm in brisbane but i, I travel all over <laughs> Um, I was laughing because I recently was asked to be vetted uh, for a piece of work and I said, oh, I don't have a website. And, you know, anyway, it took me down a path of, of building a bit of a, a brand around my business that I've, um, you know, humbly created over the last year. And uh, my business is called North. Uh, we really believe in building courageous leaders uh, uh, thinking about uh, united and connected teams and then securing impressive performance, which has to be the outcome of some of this. Um, but what I'm, where can they find me? Um, something I'm, you know, you know, a, a place I'm about to be found, if you like, is I'm, I'm really excited. Uh, a colleague, an ex-colleague, a really close friend, uh, we've teamed up and we're, we've built a, a business uh, we're about to launch uh, an experience for leaders and teams around sustainable performance. And yeah. I've mentioned a little bit of this in the podcast, but it's about challenging the idea of high performance in a complex world where we work so hard until we burn out and for what. Um, it's about the idea of sustainable performance, which we think is the ability to be and bring your best every day. 
um, the outcomes are better um, because it's about people connecting to what matters most and then being able to achieve team and organizational outcomes. So, so we, we, we think about this in terms of energy, self-compassion and purpose. Uh, and, and that's something that we're really excited uh, where we're already you know, doing this work with businesses, but we've spent the time doing the research and really bringing the experience together. So um, more on that, uh, in, uh, you know, on our LinkedIn and, and we'll be launching that that shortly. Oh, fantastic. Congratulations and, and, and good Thank luck. You. Thank you so much for, for coming Thank on. You. Thank you, Blake. It's been an absolute pleasure for having me. Appreciate it. I'm Blake Provitz and you're watching the Strategic l and Podcast. If you want to stay up to date with our latest releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you just want the audio, you'll find us on most common podcast platforms, including Spotify and Apple. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you again soon.